What's up guys and welcome to the first episode of Mile vs the Movies. If you missed the update video and you're like, what the heck is this? I have made my New Year's resolution for 2019 to watch a film, a new film, a film I've never seen before, a day for the entirety of 2019. So I'm going to watch 365 new films by the end of the year. It is going to be a fun ride and it's something I'm really excited about doing because films is one of my main interests you know it's something I'm really into and I like talking about movies so I thought why not do a little video thing about it so this is going to be like a podcasty kind of thing you know there's just going to be that uh, these lovely graphics I've made for each movie you know the poster changes for what movie I'm going to be talking about isn't that fun uh, I genuinely am quite proud of this it took me like 15 whole minutes I did it while I was sick and I think it turned out quite well yeah also if you missed that update video don't worry, I'm still going to be doing TEW stuff. This isn't getting rid of TEW. I'm just, uh, I want to do this as well. And I've not been doing the TEW stuff because I've still got a wicked bad cough. To give you an idea about it is, I just had to edit out a cough right now. <laughs> it was quite on cue, actually. It was quite it was quite dramatic. I, if it didn't like deafen people with headphones, I would leave it in just for dramatic effect. But yeah, so TEW will be coming back soon. It's a bit harder to edit those episodes, I find. Because, you know, there's a video to consider as well. So, I probably won't do that until I'm 100%. Like, the cough's almost away, but, you know, I don't want to, like... I don't want to make episodes that I wouldn't be happy with. But for this, I definitely want to do this. Because otherwise, I'd be covering two weeks of movies in one week. And that would be a long video. So, yeah, I'm going to start with what I watched on January the 1st. Which was, as you can see from the poster on screen, Escape from New York directed by John Carpenter in 1981. So for each movie, I'm going to give a little summary, then a list of pros or things I liked, then some cons or things I don't like, and then overall rating of the movie, like what I thought of it. Like out of 10, probably. Don't take the numbers as gospel, because I've probably written them, and there's probably some I already want to change. Like I'm already reconsidering the one I did on the second. But let's stick with the one on the first. So summary of Escape from New York, if you've never seen it. Set in the far-flung distant future year of 1997, New York has been converted, the whole of Manhattan Island, into a maximum security prison because the crime rate has shot through the roof because society's gone to crap, basically. The President's Plane, uh, played by uh, Donald Pleasance, which is quite fun with him being in Halloween. Uh, so he's in another Carpenter film, hijacked and is crashed deliberately into New York by the People's Liberation Front of America, I think they are. And uh, luckily for the president, he survives the crash, but he gets kidnapped. But luckily for him, he's very lucky, this president, I will say. Uh, a former Special Forces man who's been convicted of a crime uh, called Snake Pliskin. He is about to be put into New York. So the police commissioner of New York is kind of like a general, basically. Uh, recruits him to save the president. So he's going to save him from the sinister Duke of New York, played by Isaac Hayes. So, there's your little plot summary. I'm not going to spoil the movie. Like all the movies I talk about, I'm not going to spoil them. Except for every Saturday I'm watching a terrible movie. And sometimes spoilers about them might come out. But to be honest, you weren't going to watch them anyway. Or maybe you were. But like, they're forewarnings, you know? <laughs> it's like the uh, Abandon Hope Ball Ye Who Enter Here sign. That's the kind of movies we're talking about on the Saturdays. <laughs> so, pros. So, first one I have down here is the music. Now, the theme from Escape from New York is amazing. The music's owned by John Carpenter. It's very, you know... This is going to sound a bit silly, but very John Carpentery. It's very, uh, like, synthy. It's very atmospheric. It's very tense. It's a very good soundtrack. Like, I really... It hits you right at the beginning, because, like, the opening credits are just, like, white text on a back background. So, you know, you've basically just got that and the score going, and the score really shines. It's really good. Now, the other thing I was going to say I really like, here we go. Point number two, the cast. Oh my, this cast, 
This is kind of like a cast. If I was to make a movie in 1981, I would probably make this cast. So you've got... Everyone's really strong, you know, in it. There's not, like, bad... There's not a bad performance in this movie. But, like, you've got... Kurt Russell as your lead in an 80s action movie. So automatically, good start. You've got Lee Van Cleef as, like, a no-nonsense police commissioner. He's amazing in it. You've got Donald Pleasance as the meek president of America, which is kind of fun, considering, you know, when he's in Halloween with John Carpenter, he's like a crazy psychiatrist, basically. He's, like, tough as nails. You've got Isaac Hayes, who isn't, you know, really an actor. He's a musician. But, God, he's actually pretty good. He's pretty sinister. He has, like, this weird, uh, like, facial tick characteristic going on. It just adds, like, a lot to this, like, character who styled himself as a duke in this, like, you know, post-apocalyptic New York. It's really, really, a really good performance. you got, like, Ernest Borgnine as, like, a comic relief cab driver. Even, like, the smaller parts are all really well played. So it's definitely a strong cast in the movie. Thirdly, let's talk about the production of the movie. This movie had a budget of six million dollars. Now, that obviously sounds like a lot to all of us, and I think I think the average person would be quite happy with six million dollars in their pocket. But for a movie, that's not that much. It's only sixteen million in today's terms, so that is not a lot for a like movie set in a city with like all lots of locations and special effects and all kinds of crazy stuff. It is amazing the production of this movie. Like there's these there's these shots where you see like a, a helicopter's point of view as it's scanning the city in New York. And it's this amazing like wireframe city model. So like they built a model, painted it black, put green lines on it to be the wireframes of the buildings. There's all kinds of like crazy effects and like stuff. Not really crazy effects, but like things that you go, that's impressive for a movie of the time and of the budget, you know? This isn't like, you know, a huge blockbuster. But I think it did quite well at the box office, actually. But, you know, it wasn't, you know, meant to be like a huge, you know, this is a summer tent pole release or anything. Let's see, what else I want to... Oh, yeah, also, the Duke's car. So, like, there are some cars in the city. Uh, most of them is, is basically... There's not much life for the prisoners to have in New York. There's not, like, guns lying around or anything like that. But the Duke's car is, like, the most amazing car I've ever seen in a movie. So, he's got, like, this, like, uh, I think it's, like, a Cadillac or something. And on his on his mirror, you know, hanging from, like, his rearview minute mirror, he has a goddamn mirror ball. <laughs> and I'm like, that's amazing. So, it's, like, it's a huge one. Well, it's not just, like, a small one. It is, like, it's, like, about the size of Isaac Hayes' head hanging off the mirror. And on his front, over his lights on, like, raised, uh, like, bars, I would guess, you'd say, are chandeliers. He has chandeliers hanging above his lights in his car. It is an amazing vehicle. Like, how this has not been, like, taken and put into, like, a Grand Theft Auto game or something, I don't know. Because it looks really fun. <laughs> There's another positive. The tension in this movie is really, really palpable. I know Carpenter would go on to make The Thing, which is, you know, probably the cinema hallmark for tense movies. I know that's one of the main things people like about it, as well as the uh, gloopy monsters. But, uh, but I've not seen that either. It's on my list. Uh, but, like, the way the whole thing kind of happens, the way Pliskin is in the city of... I think it's still millions. I don't know how many people are in the prison. I don't think they ever tell us explicitly. But a lot of people are in this city. And basically all of them will kill Pliskin. Because he's the only person with a gun. So straight away everyone would like that gun. Obviously. But you've got like the Duke has like basically an army. That follows him. And is like fanatically quite devoted to him. So there's like a real sense of like. Every scene you feel like. You're waiting for the the mob of people to find him. Or like, you know, he's going to round a corner and there's someone's going to jump out. Like, I... There's like a lot of scenes going down tight, narrow alleys. And every scene of those, I was like, someone's going to jump out a door and get him. 
And then eventually one time it did happen. I was like, I knew it. <laughs> the whole movie, I was waiting for that. But yeah, it's really good. Really, really tense. And uh, let's see what else I've got here as a pro. Oh, yes. A lovely little uh, wrestling fact for those of you who are, you know, the people that like my wrestling videos. Ox Baker, the professional wrestler, makes a cameo in this. And it's really quite bizarre and unexpected. And I was like, oh, hello, famous wrestler. So that's fun. That's something for you to look out for. He's easily recognisable. For those of you who've never seen Ox Baker, he was bald and had a huge, like, Fu Manchu moustache, like, but it was pitch black, and had black eyebrows, and, like, the ends of the eyebrows were, like, turned up to look like spikes, basically. He looks amazing. Like, he has that, like, 70s territory monster look. Probably because he was a 70s territory monster. He's great. The guy who had the heart punch, that was his thing. And it was, like, the story behind it was you'd punch him in the heart, it would stop his heart for, like, five seconds. And then he would pin them. And then there was like this one scene, there's this one time he nearly caused a riot because he kept doing it to a guy over and over again. So it was basically to all the fans he was trying to murder this guy. It's crazy. But yeah, that's enough wrestling talk. This is, this is about movies. <laughs> this is the other interest I have. <laughs> yeah, the cons. I'm going to come out and say this. This is like quite a famous thing about this movie. But this lovely poster... You know, showing the Statue of Liberty decapitated head lying in the middle of the street. Never happens in the movie. Never happens. Never appears. Nothing. I think the Statue of Liberty does appear. But it's like fine. It's like an infamous like cover with stuff that doesn't happen in it. The movie's still good, don't get me wrong. But it's quite like an, it's just a weird little thing. And also, another slight problem I have with the movie is it's quite clear that the budget was small at certain points. Because you get things like certain things you don't get shown. So we get like, uh, we get, oh, I missed one of my pros. Oh, I will, I'll just quickly mention this. One of my other pros was I really enjoyed the ending. The ending for the film is quite fun. I won't tell you what it is, but I quite liked it. I'm not sure if everyone else does, but I liked it. But yeah, back to the budget problems. The, so for example, when the president's playing crashes you never actually see that you see the aftermath you know you see the wreckage he's like in like a pod thing so he doesn't get killed in the plane crash but like you don't see the actual crash itself happen which obviously if it had a bigger budget you would have seen but it's kind of effective just seeing like the little blip on the radar just like go and then disappear that's kind of cool so it could have been like a stylistic thing as well, but also it probably is a stylistic choice as well as much as a I can't afford to make this choice, you know? But that's just like something. I, w I want something to talk about in the cons, even if I really enjoyed the movie. And my overall rating for Escape from New York, that's a big 8 out of 10. Really enjoyed it, and I think you should all check it out. Now, on to our second film from the 2nd of January, which is Wednesday. And it's Bird Box, a Netflix original movie directed by Suzanne Beyer, am I as pronounced, from 2018. Uh, of course, everyone at the moment, well, at the time I was recording this, was doing the Bird Box Challenge where they were walking around blindfolded. And I thought the Bird Box Challenge was watching the movie. Ba -ba -da -ba -da. Hey, that's your one joke for this episode. I hope you like it. So, summary of the plot. We jump between two settings, like two time periods, as we follow Mallory, when mysterious creatures show up and cause mass suicides, and we, our second time period is five years later, as she travels down a river with two children, and the creatures affect only those that look at them, that's why she's going around with the blindfold on. It's a bit like a quiet place, but we're seeing things instead of making noise. Here are my pros for the movie. There's a couple. Uh, the acting was alright, I thought. Like, uh, Sandra Bullock was alright in it, I guess. She was like, you know, she wasn't rubbish or anything. She was like quite a good protagonist. And uh, the film had a surprise John Malkovich, which I didn't know about. So when he showed up, I was like, hey, it's John Malkovich. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I was quite happy with that. And I think the... Uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you the name of the character. Because it's kind of a spoiler. But the girl she's with... Uh, when she's travelling on the boat. You know, in the future scenes. Or I suppose that's the present day and the other bits of the past. But uh, she's a really good actress. She's like about six or something. She's really good. I thought for like a child actor. So hopefully she's in other things. Uh, I also liked. This is like the end of the positives. This is a bad sign. Uh, the shots. There's like a lot of shots with a blindfolded POV. So we see like the material of the blindfold over the camera. Like we're seeing from Sandra Bullock's point of view. And those shots are really good. And I feel like they don't get used enough. Like they're really compelling. They really... They're like quite tense, and I feel like they could use them a bit more. And like certain scenes, I think it would be scarier if we didn't fully see what was going on. Like there's a certain scene on the boat when they're going on the river, where you get it after a certain point. But I think it would be scarier if we didn't see it at all. Like just through the blindfold, it would make it quite tense. I think. I could get maybe turn some people off, but I think it would be good, but I don't know. Maybe they tried it and it didn't work, but anyway. Let's go on to the cons. It's too long. That's my first con for this movie. It is, it is far too long. <laughs> I put down 20 minutes. I feel like it's probably a good half hour too long. I can't mind how long it is. It's like about two hours something. I want to say two hours and like ten, but it, it feels that length rather than you know, being a joy to watch, sit through. Uh, the ending for the film, this is like a new con, sorry, but the ending for the film completely doesn't sit right with me. I looked it up because I was like intrigued because I was like, it's based on a book. Does the book have a different ending? It does have a different ending that's more in keeping with the tone of the story. Like, I don't want to... I don't want to spoil what the ending is, because like I said, I'm avoiding spoilers, but I just, it didn't sit quite right with me. It felt a bit tacked on, like it didn't fit right with the story. Some of the characters are super undeveloped. We're on to con number three. Super undeveloped characters. There's a character played by Machine Gun Kelly. I'm not being funny. He has three scenes in the movie where he develops his character, where it's literally established plot happening like establish the reason he's in the movie enact the reason he's in the movie conclude the reason he's in the movie like that is his character described and like there's a lot of the other ones we don't get much about we get like a bit about some like we get a bit about um uh, the guy who plays the uh, geneticist who clones the dinosaurs in jurassic park yeah, but his character's more developed than the Machine Gun Kelly character. And there's a few people where it's they get, like, a sentence of development, and it kind of sucks. You know, you'd kind of like to see a bit more of them, you know? Or at least know a bit about them. You feel like there's you don't really know a lot about people. And not in, like, a, the world's so bleak they don't bother learning about the people they meet. It just feels like they couldn't be bothered. <laughs> uh... I've got just another con here, and I kind of still stick with it. The fact that most of the movie is a flashback. So, like, it's about 90% is the flashback, and about 10% is the river. The fact it's a flashback kind of really removes tension from the flashback scenes. Because it makes it quite obvious what's going to happen. I'm not going to say what's going to happen, but I feel it makes it really obvious what happens to characters and, you know... It kind of just removes the tension in a way. And another con, I didn't like the monsters. Their abilities are kind of confusing. So like, if you look at them, like they take the form of your deepest fear, or like your greatest anxiety or whatever, and that then causes the people to commit suicide. Okay. But we get scenes where, like, they are never depicted in the movie. They're just kind of like a presence. Like, the leaves rustle or, like, you know, the parking sensors go off on a car or something like that. The problem I have with it is characters run away from them. 
And at no point do we uh, start, run away blindfolded from them, I might add. That's one of my other major flaws is everyone's walking around standing up while blindfolded. Where I'm like, you could be crawling around on all floors, then you won't trip over. I know you won't move as fast, but when you're not moving fast, you know, when you're just taking your time slowly walking outside, better to be on all fours and crawling and not break your neck when you fall down a flight of stairs because you were standing up. Sorry, that just, that really rankled me. <laughs> it's like no one thought of crawling. Thank God there aren't, thank God there isn't a baby in the movie that would have that. That literally does happen in the movie. The baby doesn't crawl at any point, but still, you know, just really rankles me. No one thought of crawling. But uh, yeah, the monsters, they're never shown to physically interact with stuff, really. Like, they never interact with the people. They just scare them. So it's like, why would you run away? I get, you know, it'll kill you. But if you have the blindfold on, as long as you can't see it, it can't hurt you. So why would you run away? You know, because then it it does go badly for the character when they run away. So why would you do that? Just, you know, something I didn't like. And this is a thing I really had a problem with. I did not like the portrayal of mental health problems in this movie. Now that sounds strange and kind of out of nowhere. But I'm, I'm going to go into this plot detail because it really annoys me. So people who are insane aren't affected by the monsters. They, like, look at them. And they then want to make everyone else look at them. Because they see something nice. And my, like, first of all, I don't like that at all. Because it's not a particular condition. It's not people with schizophrenia or people with, like, you know, I can't remember their mental health, but, like, people with multiple personalities. It's not people with one condition, like something wrong with their brain chemistry or that. It's just anyone who's crazy automatically wants to kill everyone <laughs> like so I don't like that part and also I don't like it doesn't establish what's the cut off like would someone with depression look at them and go well you know I'm gonna now kill a bunch of people by making them look at these monsters or like would someone with anxiety issues have that would someone who has panic attacks kill those people it doesn't make any sense, and I really hate it, and it's it's basically kind of offensive. I find it quite offensive. Like, I don't like it. I gave this movie a 5 out of 10 when I rated it originally, and that was straight after I watched it, and the more I think about it, I'm going to put it down to, like, 3, I think. I'm actually going to change it. In my book, I've got, like, a wee notebook. I actually got a diary where I'm writing all these songs down. And I genuinely, that, the main thing with the portraying of mental health problems, really didn't like it. Found it quite, it, it's more like something you would see in like a 70s movie. You know, when like, that would be a progressive portrayal. <laughs> I just, I didn't like it. I didn't think it was good. There's my review of Bird Box. <laughs> Don't watch it. Or watch it with a blindfold on. <laughs> I think that would have actually improved the movie. John Malkovich is good for. Which nicely segues into movie free. Because movie free. You can tell why I picked. So like each day I'm picking the next day's movie. So you can see how I picked this one. And then on day three. Which is Thursday the 3rd of January. We watched Being John Malkovich. <laughs> Which I watched on Netflix, directed by Spike Jones, from the year 1999. Now, go through the summary of this movie. So, Craig Schwartz, he is an out-of-work puppeteer, played by um, John Cusack, who takes a job as a filer, I think it is, in a kind of strange company. We don't really know what it does, apart from filing. Um, only to discover while he's at work a portal that leads into the head of John Malkovich as in actually into his brain where people can see through his eyes for 15 minutes this is a strange movie I really like it <laughs> so 
Gonna go through the pros. First of all, funny. This movie is really, really funny. It's really quirky. It's really weird. Very surreal. It's kind of like a weird dream you would have. Like, it feels like... It feels more like a movie that, like, you would describe to someone and be like, you dreamt that movie. That movie isn't real. Who would make a movie about being John Malkovich for 15 minutes? The answer is Spike Jones. But it's great. I love it. <laughs> Um, next pro, John Malkovich himself. He is amazing in this movie. He is amazing at playing himself. As strange as that sounds, because I don't want to get into too much plot, but he's really good at, like, he has to do a lot of weird, weird stuff in this movie. And he's really good at it. It gets, like, really weird the more you go into it. It's, like, really interesting. I... Genuinely, this is like this is one of my favourite films now, I think. The puppeteering scenes, this is like another pro I liked. There's like puppeteering scenes where we see like some of uh, uh what's his name? Craig's puppetry. They were really well done. Like I don't know who the puppeteers are that did that, but they did a really good job. They were really good scenes. I also uh another pro, the story. I um, sort of mentioned this earlier, but it had a lot of unexpected twists and turns. Like, you think you know where it's going. Well, you don't really, because it's a movie about being John Malkovich for 15 minutes. That alone is weird enough. But when you start to get a handle on it, it skews off in a weird direction. And it's, like, all over the place in, like, a good way. Like, you're like, I didn't expect that to happen. Didn't expect this to happen. That's bizarre. That's weird. I love it. And uh, there's two sequences in particular. Under our next pro, there's two sequences in particular with a portal. I'm not going to spoil what they are, but I love them. So one, I'll, I'll tell you this one, because this scene is kind of famous outside of the movie, is when John Malkovich himself uses the John Malkovich portal. That scene is amazing and so weird, and I loved it. And the other one, I'm not going to tell you this because this is much later on in the plot, but there's a chase scene, and that's very well done. That's really cool. That's like a really fun scene. Cons. Only only one. And it's all, it's all sort of like a, eh, one. I think we could have maybe seen a bit more of Craig's relationship with his wife. Like, she's important to the plot, but we don't really see much of them as a couple before the plot kind of starts. I kind of would have liked to have seen that a bit more. Because, like, you don't really get a sense that they like each other. <laughs> you know? As, like, at all. Which is, like, a bit weird. Because they're married. You know, I imagine they like each other a bit. Unless that's part of some comment that I didn't pick up on. You know, it's like some comment about married couples not getting on with each other. In which case, very well done. That's very clever. <laughs> it might be. Spike Jones is quite clever, actually. But, uh, that is literally the only <laughs> problem I have with this movie. It is a great movie. I gave it a 9 out of 10. I loved it. It was weird. It was really weird. Like, I can't stress enough how weird it is. But if you like kind of weird, quirky movies, and you've not seen it, watch it. I'm just realize if every single one I'm telling you whether to watch it or not, which wasn't part of my, part of my planned format, but I'm adding it in anyway. So now, we're on to movie 4. And Blade Runner 2049. Directed by... Denis Villeneuve from 2017. So, for plot summary, set 30 years after the original in 2049, we follow K, who is a replicant Blade Runner. We'll get on to that. Well, I'll just cover it then. What a replicant is. So, a replicant is like an android human kind of person, and a Blade Runner is a police officer who hunts down rogue replicants. Basic premise. If you if you've not seen Blade Runner, this I don't think I'll talk about the spoilers for that. But you might want you might want to see Blade Runner. It's quite good. Uh, but anyway, we follow K, who uncovers a big revelation that could forever alter the human replicant dynamic, and that's all I'm gonna say. Because like I feel like there's quite a bit of spoilers for this plot. Because it's quite plot. This movie, there's a lot of plot. The pros for it. First of all, the I've just realized I've completely butchered spelling cinematography. But the cinematography in this movie is really good. Like, it looks 
gorgeous. Like the shots are lovely. Like everything about it, like the composition, like the way things are like silhouetted, like the colors, the lighting. Oh, the lighting! Right, the lighting in this movie is like amazing. It's all dark and moody, and like you've got like the bright neon foe from the city, but there's like lots of rain because it's Blade Runner. <laughs> it's really, really good. It looks gorgeous. So, moving on to their second positive point, the production design, really strong. It looks and feels like a sequel should. You know, it feels like a continuation of that story. So rather than feeling like a 2017 future, it feels like a 1970s future? Wait, when did Blade Runner come out? Is it the 70s or the 80s? I think it's the 70s, but it feels like a 70s future rather than a 2010s future. So it's still like screens and like not everything's touch based and you know it just feels like an older setting. So you know it feels more in keeping with the first film. The performances very good. Like uh, all the characters I thought were pretty strong. In particular for Jared Leto plays a quite sinister character in it and he is really good and really creepy. I also really enjoyed Ryan Gosling's performance in it. I thought he was very good as the replicant. And uh, all the other supporting characters are good too. Especially, shout out to Doc. The Doc who's in the movie. He's a good Doc. For our next pro, we've got the music. It was really, really good. Hans Zimmer did it. And uh, someone else, whose name I don't have to hand. But it is really, like... A forceful, I will say. No, I was going to say loud... But that just makes it sound like I had the volume up on the telly. But it's really, like, it hits you full on. Like, like you know the music is here. But in, like, a good way. Not in, like, a, you know, distracting from the scene way. In a way, it feels right. It feels... I, I hate saying this because it sounds cliche. But it feels like a Blade Runner sequel would and should. I really like, quite like this movie a lot. Uh... We're going on to our, oh no, I forgot, we've got one last pro. I nearly moved on to my cons, but I wrote this pro down later because I remembered it. I was going to say, the plot and the story, I think, are actually quite good. Quite interesting. Quite, you know, and I don't want to go into it too much. But like, there's a lot of, like, stuff in it where you're like, oh, like, is this this case or is it that? What's going on? Who's, you know, on what, well, not, who, not who's on what side, but, you know, who knows what and Stuff like that. Quite fun. The cons now. Firstly, the length is probably a little too long. It's like 164 minutes, which is about 2 hours 40. That is what I thought it was in memory. I, I looked it up just to double check, and it was the length I thought it was. Very pleased with myself. But yeah, it does. It could be like a little bit shorter. I don't. Well, there's one scene in particular I think you could cut out, which I'm going to come on to. But, like, uh, I don't know what you would cut, but you need to cut something. It's a bit too long at certain points. It just feels a bit too... Like, I wouldn't like to have seen this in a cinema, because I feel like I would have got quite uncomfortable sitting for, like, this length of time in a cinema. <laughs> and my other con for this movie is there is a sex scene in it, and it feels really unnecessary. It feels tacked on in a way and it just it doesn't quite sit with me I feel like it's trying to make a point on like the relationship between humans and AI like you know can you love something that's not really a person or something like that but it just doesn't really like sit right with me it just kind of is weird it doesn't it doesn't kind of fit with the movie to be honest it just it feels like something from another movie it feels like something from like uh what's that movie the is is it her the whack and phoenix thing we've not seen that that's not on my list actually but like where he's like in love with like a like a siri kind of thing like it feels like something that would be in a movie like that but it's just in this movie about android people <laughs> So I wasn't super keen on it. But overall, I think it's a pretty good movie. I gave it an 8 out of 10. 
And I think you should watch it. Probably if you've seen this, if you've seen the original, I reckon you should see it. Also, if you're seeing the original, see one of the good cuts of it, because there's like a million. And also, apparently people think the ending of this movie is ambiguous, ambiguous, and I don't think it is in the slightest. It's not like the ambiguous thing in Blade Runner, where like, I'll just tell you this ambiguous thing in Blade Runner, where it's, is Deckard a replicant or not? I think he is. Some people think he's not. I think he is, and I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest to, to suggest my theory and to support my theory. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, I feel like I'm gonna wheel out like a crazy person, like you know, bored with all the pins and bits of string to prove it. But like, I think he is, and I think I don't think they're trying to go for that. But I think people wanted them to have like a thing like that, where it's like, is this the case or not? I, I don't think it's ambiguous at all, the ending. I think it's pretty clear what happens. I might eventually do, like, a spoilery discussion about certain movies so I can talk about, like, the things like that. But, yeah. So, 8 out of 10 for that. I think you should watch this if you've seen the original and you enjoyed it. And I would definitely watch the original first, otherwise you're not going to appreciate it. Definitely go see, definitely see Blade Runner before you see Blade Runner 2049, because it is a sequel. <gasps> but, I think it's worth a watch. I think it was quite good. It was better than I thought it would be. When I found out they were making a sequel to Blade Runner, I thought this was going to be one of the worst movies ever made, because it sounded terrible. It's like, sequel to Blade Runner? Nope. Just, pr- goes, just goes to show that sometimes the sequels, sequels can be good sometimes. Not often. Oh god, I've been been delaying this next film, so here we go. Film number five. The final film for this episode. Normally, we'll be having seven, obviously, but with this year starting on a Tuesday, we're not having the full week's worth of films. So, Saturday the 5th of January, when I'm recording this, I watched the amazing bulk on Amazon Prime. This is my bad movie for the week. As you will shortly find out. This was directed by Louis Schoenbrunn. And was made in 2008. And came out in 2011. So that's already a sign of quality. In fact, I think it's actually longer than that. Because Amazon Prime lists it as coming out in 2015. So I'm not really sure. IMDb says 2011 I believe. There's a headstone in the movie that says 2011. But I think the movie was meant to be set in the future when it was made and came out. So it took so long to come out, it came out <laughs> when it was the real time. It says 2012 on a, on IMDb. So just whenever you want it to be, basically. So I'll try and... Sum- I'm going to summarise this movie's plot. God almighty. Okay, so it's a parody of The Incredible Hulk, if you can't tell from the hilarious pun name. Took them hours for that. A scientist is trying to create a formula of some kind and he injects himself with and turns himself into the Incredible Bulk who's never called that in the movie he's never got a name I would try and describe more of the movie but the plot of this movie is kind of a sequence of events that happen so there's nothing you can kind of cut out but also you could cut out everything so it's uh, like uh, our main character is Henry Hank Howard, because comic books, I guess. And uh, so Henry's at the lab and is trying to test his serum on the rats, and that doesn't work. So then he goes to see his girlfriend's dad, who's the person who's in charge of the operation, to ask him to marry his daughter. But then he says no, and they have a big argument. So then he and the daughter go to an amu- go to the fairground. So then he and the... You see, it's one of those movies, so it's where it's just, so then they... And that's how the entire movie goes. So, we're going to go over the pros of this movie. I have a pro. It took me a while to think of one, but I thought of one, and it's not a compliment. <laughs> so, the movie's music is all classical music as far as I can tell I think there's like a couple of stock tracks we'll get into the stock element of this movie oh my word there might be a good portion of this video might just be me ranting about how insane this movie was 
but the classical music was good because it was classical music and it was stock stuff. So it was basically, it was good music. That is the one pro for the movie done. Now the cons. I have to give you an idea how much I've written. I've had to draft in a second sheet of paper to fill the cons in for the amazing bulk. That is how bad this movie was. Like, I still can't quite believe I saw it with my own eyes. So, cons. The story. Like I said, it is a complete nonsensical collection of events. Now this movie is only... Uh, 76 minutes long? Let's double check that on IMDb because I have the page up. Uh, 76? Spot on. God. I have that knowledge in my brain. I have the length of the amazing bulk in my brain till the day I die now. That's great. To get an idea of how good this movie is, for those of you those of you who put credence in audience review scores, this has a 1.7 from 2,000 reviews on IMDb. This is a bad movie. So yeah. So the story is just a nonsensical collection of scenes. So we have like, like he's trying to create a formula of some kind. And I still don't know why. Like, I watched the entirety of this movie and he never once says... Oh, we're creating a formula to do blank. At one point, he tries it on a plan, and the plan comes more alive. Is more there's more plan. <laughs> like you know, we get like a purple smoke cloud, and then like the the uh, plant is replaced with a bigger plant. So I don't know if it's meant to promote things growing. We'll come into. What, like, there's like, okay, I'll just say it because it's like, we're, who cares about the plot of this movie? There's an evil scientist in it called Dr. Tantlove, who has ED. That's, you know, really funny joke there, guys. <laughs> to get a lot of time to work out that. And it turns out he's funding the research that the uh, Dr. Howard's doing to cure his problem. Even though you can cure that problem already. Like, that exists. (laughs) Um, So, I don't... I just... I don't see... I don't know. Okay. Like, I don't know. I just... I don't know. This movie, like... It hurt to watch. Like I said, I watched this. And I still can't quite comprehend it was real. But we'll get into that more. So, we're going to move on from the story. We'll come back to the story probably as we go through it. I might actually, at one point, make a video just going through this movie. Scene by scene, dissecting it. Because it is... I just... I don't believe it. <laughs> like, I've, I've written this at one point in my notes. Which I'll probably get to eventually. But if I didn't know better, I would swear it was like some surrealist work of art. To like, intentionally make the worst film possible. Like, it genuinely feels like that. It is so weird. So the production... This is their next con. The production quality. Now, for those of you that have seen any of the Amazing Bulk, you know what I'm going to talk about now. The entirety of this movie, so the entirety of the 76 minutes of screen time, is green screened. Now, you're thinking, oh, a lot of blockbusters are screens green screened. How could this no-budget movie not be good? But the backgrounds for all of these are stock 3D models and like 3D images that are kind of on the same quality as clip art. So if you picture like a 3D model clip art, that is what the scenes look like. So rather than like in the science lab scenes, for example, we don't see like a picture of a science lab and like they're green screened into it. We see some person's 3D model of a science lab and that's what they're in. It is mind boggling. <laughs> we have um these audio issues as well. The audio is really weird. The audio sounds like it's recorded at the time, but some parts of it sound dubbed over. Uh I just want to I just want to go quickly. I don't think I mentioned this in my notes, so I'm gonna mention it while I remember. Parts of this movie are just gonna come to me as I go through it. Uh uh, there's a scene with a general guy, so he's like the Thunderbolt Ross of the movie. If you know 
your Incredible Hulk. That's like, he is the father of the Hulk's girlfriend, but he's hunting down the Hulk, but he doesn't know the Hulk is his daughter's boyfriend, you know. that. So it's, you know, a fun little dynamic going on there. So he is in a library, by which I mean he's in a CG library, but he has one book in his hand. And this is this is the scene. So, like, the daughter and the boyfriend are coming in, and the dad's standing there, and he just runs his finger along the top of the book and goes, I hate dust. I don't want it building up in my home. And he says, delivers it. That was delivered better, actually. It's like, I hate dust. I don't want it building up in my home. It's like the most bizarre <laughs> delivery I've ever seen or heard in a movie. It's like, strange. I don't know if it's meant to be a joke. I think, now I think about it, we'll come into this, but it rips off a lot of, like, it references a lot of movies. It does rip off a movie. I think it's maybe meant to be a reference to Doctor Strangelove. This is, like, weird. But to Doctor Strangelove and the general in that, played by George C. Scott, who's obsessed with the fact that communists want to steal our precious bodily fluids. That's, like, his thing, because he's a crazy person. So I think it's meant to be, maybe it's meant to be like that. And instead of being obsessed with precious bodily fluids, he's obsessed with dust. Which is weird. It's only in that one scene. But, you know, kind of a lot of things are only in that one scene. I need to come into the villain at some point, so there's just so much to talk about in this movie. Like, if you're like a movie reviewer and you want a movie to talk about, the amazing bulk is like the never-ending present. It, it just, everything's wrong. <laughs> Let's, let's go on to the uh, constant stock footage. So yeah, all the backgrounds are stock. We also have stock footage. That's, um, so the villain at one point uh, blows up every major landmark in the world. And it's literally like Google image search Taj Mahal. And then a firework. So not a missile, but a firework effect comes on. And it makes like a... You know, it's like a firework, you know, going through the sky and then... Like, for the firework exploding. So it does that. And just over stock images of landmarks. Then, later on, he is going to blow up the moon to impress his girlfriend. Or wife, I don't know what she is, actually. Nothing's really established in this movie. So yeah, to impress his girlfriend, he's going to blow up the moon. He launches a Saturn V rocket, which is like a rocket that the US used in the 70s. He launches one of them, so we get stock footage of a, of a space mission launch from the 70s, from the US. And then we get it landing on the moon, where we get stock footage of the moon landing. It is, this genuinely, this movie, I like, I wouldn't recommend you watching it, because it's terrible. But if you're interested in movies, if you're interested, it's kind of worth watching just to see that it's real. Like, I genuinely, like, I wouldn't believe this if I hadn't watched it. <laughs> so, let's go on to our next negative. I'm going to have to mention some at the end. I'll probably forget some. There are just so many in this movie. Okay. Oh, here's one. This is like a little bonus one. So, in the scene where he injects himself with the serum, that will eventually turn him into the Amazing Bulk. So, he injects himself with the serum, right? So, we cut to a close-up shot of his arm. And you see, like, you know, the needle going up to, like, his arm, obviously not stabbing himself with it. And then it cuts to a, a wider shot, so you're like, oh, we're, you know, so he's going to push in the plunger without actually stabbing himself. And he just puts the syringe down with the plunger pulled back. So he never injected himself with the serum. <laughs> it's just full of like these weird things like that where you're like, is that like you could almost believe this was made by like some art genius and that is on purpose, apart from the fact that it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, let's go on to our, our whatever point this is now. There are all these bizarre references to movies that aren't like the Hulk. So we have at least three scenes, I think at least three, maybe just two, where the villain references the Honeymooners, which is a sitcom from like the 50s in America, 
where he goes like, oh, zip zoom straight to the moon. And he does that twice. And you're like, who's watching the amazing bulk and appreciates the honeymooners? Bizarre. Then, <laughs> sorry, just I, I'm reading this list of movies and I'm like, these were all in this movie. So we then get uh, two references to 2001 A Space Odyssey. Because I get... I just, I just like, you think when Stanley Kubrick made 2001, he's like, one day, one day, my cinematic masterpiece will be referenced in the amazing bulk. <laughs> Twice. But, uh, yeah, so we get a scene with, uh, also Sprek Zarathustra, where, like, to let you know that it's referencing 2001, we get a shot of a spaceman in Earth, and we have like there's like a bone dot gif and it's like twirling in the air so it's like the scene with the apes and then it's just like a bunch of uh, the missile stock footage or I say missile stock footage it's not stock footage of missiles it's the landmarks when the missiles are going into them scene and uh, <laughs> then later on we get like an extended space docking scene set to the blue danube like it's 2001 where the joke is, the things dock and then undock, because it's like sex, because the guy can't have sex. That's really funny. Except, the way they do the docking undocking, is they play the footage forward and then reverse it, okay? Sensible. Except, the Earth is in all this footage underneath the space stations, so the Earth is rotating, so the Earth goes forward, back, forward, back, forward, back, and it's going like at a really fast speed. <laughs> so it's like, you know, or above Alaska, New York, Alaska, New York, Alaska, New York, like that. It is so bad looking. <laughs> Speaking of the CG stuff, sorry, I just came back into my head. There's a dog in the movie, a dog, and it's a CG dog. There's a CG rat. Like, you couldn't get a dog? <laughs> One of the actors in the movie probably has a dog. There's like 12 people in this movie, which is more than I thought they would have. I'm being honest, I thought there was going to be, like, the villain, the amazing bulk, General Ross, girlfriend, probably one or two other people. But no, there are a lot of people in this movie. A lot more than I thought. But, uh, yeah, that's... Oh yeah, also, got a reference to Doctor Strange Love, of course, where there's this, uh, <laughs> nuclear bomb scene, where uh, we get the answer marching two by two. Which, if you've never seen that, that plays over all the shots of the uh, the crew and the bomber in Doctor Strange Love that's going to drop the nuclear bomb. And uh, we get, uh, when the bomb does drop, there's a guy, there's a crappy clip art guy sitting on it, riding it down. Like he's, is it, he's clinging on to it like he accidentally fell down, rather than King, uh, General King Kong in a... Doctor Strange Love, where he's like, yeah, like that, you know, waving his cowboy hat. So it's a lot of fun. But also, going back to this, why I think the dust thing is a Doctor Strange Love reference, because they straight up steal a joke from Doctor Strange Love in this movie. So there is a, when we see this, the airplane pilot for the uh, plane sequence, the Doctor Strange Love fighter jet sequence, he has a thing on his back, like a like a patch on his jacket and it says we we kill for peace and there's like a big billboard in one of the scenes in Doctor Strange it's really prominent and it's really funny just in the background when like the military base is going crazy it says peace is our profession and I'm like you totally just nicked that off Doctor Strange because <laughs> you've clearly seen it you literally reference it in the scene with that joke so that annoyed me don't rip off a really good movie now on to the supplementary sheet of paper. This movie, man, it is unreal. So we have... Oh yeah, this is, this is this is one. So there's complete nonsensical geography in all the scenes because it's made with just stock stuff that was available. And you can tell. So like, like the opening sequence, if you watch it, you'll understand this. The opening sequence is like a lady... <laughs> who I didn't realise was a prostitute until she's dead and the police tell us. This is how good the movie is at conveying things. 
So she's just walking about the streets. And she like walks along one side of the road. And we cut to another shot. And she's like crossing over the road. So she's on the other side of the road, right? And then we cut to another shot. And the side of the road she's just crossed over from. She's walking on that side the other way. But it's meant to be a continuation of the thing from before. Like things appear in the background that were in another bit's background. There's one scene in particular I want to talk about where the, there's two police officers and they're having a conversation in a, in a car. And oh my god, I never mentioned the cars. So all the cars in the movie are, are MS Paint drawings of cars. So like when we see like the side of a car, it's like an MS Paint drawing of a car. It's like someone uh, put like a car image into paint and then painted over it in paint. And then use that so they didn't use the copyrighted image of the car. It's, it's weird. And uh, all the cars as well. When you see like the two people sitting in like the driver and the passenger seat. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're sitting on a sofa. <laughs> and you can see the sofa. Oh man, this movie. Anyway, there's a particular scene with the car. With the two police officers. They're sitting having a conversation. About uh, our hero Hank, our hero, <laughs> I put that in big inverted commas, and we're you know we're viewing them from face on, and we cut from like you know one side of the car to the other side, so we're looking through like the passenger and driver windows. <laughs> Except when we go to the shots, uh, sorry, I just thinking about this, I'm like I can't believe this happened. But when we go from one side, there's like this really prominent billboard in an alleyway. And when we got to the other side of the car, to the opposite direction, there is the same billboard in the same alleyway. Because it is the same shot on both sides. It is the same background. It is unreal. When I saw this, I like lost my mind. I was like, how can you do... Could you not get another alley dot png from stockalleys.com <laughs> that's an irving i'm not i've not written this down either right so so everything's full in front of a cg background right so everything's in front of green screen sorry so in scenes where the characters are walking or running they are running and walking on the spot very visibly like they didn't set up a wee treadmill so they could walk normally. They're very clearly just lean left, lean right, lean left, lean right. So it looks really bad. There's a bit where they're on a roller coaster and sometimes they lean for the corners and other times they don't. Yeah, there's also a roller coaster scene in this movie. In this in this ama- in the Incredible Hulk parody film, there is a roller coaster scene. Because of course there is. That really smacks of there was stock footage of a like a fairground. Because yeah, so at the fairground scene, they're at the fairground, and then they take the subway from the fairground, where he gets mugged by a guy on a moving subway train, and the guy just runs away to a different carriage. So you're like, he's on the same train, the train is moving, he can't get off the train. How can you get mugged by a guy on a moving train and not catch him? <laughs> but anyway... After that, they then get in a car. So they took the subway to go to the car. (laughs) It's just... This whole movie is, like... Mind-boggling. Anyway. So. Back to this. It's just every so often, something just comes into your head. And I need to tell you guys about this. I've hardly talked about the villain in this movie, if you noticed. Because we get scenes of him, like, cutting away from him. Cutting away to him, rather. And he only becomes the villain of the movie... Uh, like 20 minutes from the end where they're like where he gets caught the amazing bulk by the military and they're like we need you to kill the guy who's the main villain <laughs> oh it's it really is something else I thought the main villain guy I thought he was going to be really fun because I was like oh you look like like a you know like he was going to be a hammy over the top guy and he wasn't like hammy in an enjoyable way and I was really disappointed Thought he was going to be like, you know, when you like you watch like a bad movie and there's that really like over the top funny actor and you're like, hey, this guy, yeah, like like you know, your Tommy was so in your uh, the room or uh, I can't mind his name, but the the uh, 
the other d- the detective that's not Samurai Cop and Samurai Cop who just does all those facial expressions and the cutaways where he's like, ooh, and like that. I thought he was going to be like him, but no, he's not that fun. I was <laughs> really sad. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've mentioned the fact it could be like the surreal work of art. So now we need to talk about the the main sequence of this movie. The sequence that like... I- I've just written here, William Tell Overture Sequence just bizarre because okay so after bulk goes to the castle kills the bad guy kills the bad guy's girlfriend he comes outside the castle and there's like a jet and it's gonna blow up the castle and he's like oh call him off you know general thunderbolt ross i can't mind your real name (laughs) i can't mind his name in the movie he's just general thunderbolt ross to me except he looks (laughs) nice So there's this one scene where he can't get angry to become the bulk, so he takes out a picture of the uh, the girlfriend's dad, Thunderbolt Ross, to get angry, and instead of being a picture of him in character, it's just like the actor's headshot, but in the actor's headshot, he just looks like a sweet, nice old man, like he just looks like a nice, friendly guy who would like, you know, work in a library and help you find a book, you know, he just looks really friendly. And he looks at it, and then he's like, Rrr! he's like so angry. <laughs> it's like, it's just a nice photo of a man. <laughs> but yeah, the William Tell Overture sequence. Sorry, just all these bizarre plot points keep coming back to me, and it's like, it's like I need to convey them. I, I have to spread the message of the amazing bulk. I have to correct myself every time, because every time I want to call it incredible bulk, because, you know, like, that's the thing. Opening credits, closing credits, Comic Sans on both of them. Just to give you an idea of how professional production we're talking about. And I'm convinced it's because Comic Sans, they saw it and went, comic like a comic book. Use it. <laughs> but yeah, so the William Tell Overture sequence. So, missile coming, that's where we got to. We got to, like, uh, the general, like, is uh, going to blow up the castle and he's on the phone to him and he's like, don't blow up the castle, I'm here. Killed all the bad guys. And then... The general's like, actually, I'm screwing you over. I can't make you not the amazing bulk. So you're going to die now because I betrayed you because I'm the real bad guy. And I was in league with the actual bad guy that I had you kill the whole time. So you're like, oh, no. So then the William Tell Overture sequence begins. So the William Tell Overture, you probably know, you know, dun, 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 like that. So that song plays as the amazing bulk runs away from this helicopter. So we're in a medieval castle, a European medieval castle that's somewhere. I'm saying we never find out the name of the city we're in. Don't know where things are. We're somehow in a European medieval castle. I don't know if we're in Europe. But the reason I say I don't know we're in Europe because the first shot when we're running away, we run into a CG background with the CG model amazing bulk. And uh, the CG model Amazing Bulk is horrific, by the way. But he runs, he runs in, and uh, he runs past a kangaroo and a little CG cartoon man throwing a boomerang around himself, and it's spinning around him. And it only gets weirder from there. We just get random stuff, just random images flash up on screen. Like, I genuinely felt like in Clockwork Orange, when the guy's getting shown the footage to break his mind with his eyes getting held open, that's what this sequence feels like. It feels like some sort of hidden coded message. There's, like, we get shots of a submarine that's like the Nautilus from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. We get a dog flying through the air wearing a cape with a superhero, like, with a superhero cape on, and he's flying through the air like Superman. The dog that was randomly in these scenes. It's like the little crappy clip art dog. We get like a red baron plane from World War 2. We get uh, the helicopter. We get, um, wait is the, no, the, the, the leprechaun is earlier in the movie. There's a leprechaun as well at one point, just for some reason. Uh, just like him running, he runs past a train at one point. Where it's like, you know that cliche where like the guy's getting chased and he runs past a train tracks as the train arrives and that cuts off the guy chasing him. Except the guy chasing him is in a helicopter, so it doesn't factor into the story at all. <laughs> it's just 
And it's like an old timey train. It's like an 1800s train. It's not like a modern train. Like there's a bit where it's just a random guy at a bar. Again, a CG guy, a CG bar, like a clip art guy sitting at a clip art bar in the middle of a desert and he runs across the road there and it goes on for ages until he gets blown up by a nuclear bomb and everyone thinks he dies and then he's not dead. Uh, I forgot to mention as well, the amazing bulk when he's on screen is entirely portrayed with a CG character model that sometimes clips into itself because, you know, it's a well-made movie. Uh, except for... Sorry, I was just thinking about this. Uh, except for sometimes where it's portrayed by a... a the one effect that I think was made for this, which is a giant blue hand, a purple hand, sorry, with, like, like fingernails, and then another hand that is one of the kid's Hulk hands. You know the Hulk hands toys where, like, you get the two fists and you smash them again and it goes like... Arr! It's one of those painted purple very badly. That's just my engine. And then one time where he snatches a helicopter out of the sky... Uh, is the detective who's in this movie painted purple like and topless portrays the bulk in one scene and that is the portrayals of the amazing bulk in the movie this oh man this movie I think this movie might be the death of me <laughs> I don't know how much is going to come across in the video but I've had to stop and cough a lot of times talking about this movie it is it is just like, I couldn't believe the William Tell Overture sequence. And, like, the villain... I hardly talked about the villain. The villain of the story. He doesn't factor into the story. <laughs> well, I hardly mentioned the girlfriend. There's, like, two police people that are investigating his mugger. I never mentioned the mugger who stole the engagement ring. The whole movie's a mess. Like, stuff just happens so other stuff can happen. It's so... It's so weird. And the jokes. Oh, God, right. So there's this one scene with the villain and he's got these two henchmen and there are jokes in this scene. Like, I want you to know jokes had, like, inverted commas around it that were big enough to, like... If I put the if I put jokes on screen, all you would see would be inverted commas. That's how big it was. And, oh my god, it is the least funny bit I've seen. The, one of the henchmen looks a bit like the nostalgia critic merged with Nicolas Cage to me. And he acts like the Nostalgia Critic. And it's really kind of distracting and weird. It's not funny. It's really, really not funny. And it's like, it's meant to be funny. And it's really not. That's why I would hesitate in recommending you watch it. Because there's a lot of humour in the movie that isn't funny. Because I think it is trying to be a So Bad It's Good movie. And I think... I think the the bits where it's trying to be funny intentionally are bad and the bits where it's just bad are funny. <laughs> like it is so for for my review I gave this a 1 out of 10. Just to give you an idea. This is like possibly the worst like technically like on a technical level this might be the worst movie I've ever seen. And I've seen some bad movies, but this might be the worst. Like, I cannot stress enough how bad it is. You get, like, you get occasional bits where, like, the green screen's not right, where you get, like, bits of getting clipped off people. There's this one scene where, like, a character's almost, like, a bit transparent, where it's, like, the doctor guy and his girlfriend sitting on a chair, where he launches all the missiles to blow up all the landmarks in the world. Um, It's just... I... I like, I'm... It's, it's so, like... There's like one bit, right, right at the beginning, where they establish him calming himself down by counting backwards from ten, right? Now in a normal movie, where like the character gets angry, you think that would factor into the plot, wouldn't you? You'd be like, oh, they're setting that up. So when he becomes the amazing bulk, he's going to count backwards from ten, and then that'll, you know, calm him down and prevent him becoming the bulk and doing something stupid. Except it never comes up again. This whole movie... <laughs> is infuriating. <laughs> Genuinely one of the most unsettling experiences I think I've ever had. Like, I just... I Like, I kind of want other people to see it, 
so I can know I didn't imagine it. Like, you know I said, like, being John Malkovich felt like a movie that someone would dream up? Amazing Bulk feels like something you would dream up after taking up some PCP. Like, this movie is not real. <laughs> I don't know if PCP makes you hallucinate. I think it does. Don't know. But, I, if it does, I feel like I would see the Amazing Bulk again. I would relive it. And what a dream that would be. <laughs> I just, I, I, I'm like, I'm kind of lost for words to how I finished the section of the video, because I'm just like, I feel like there's still more to talk about. I feel like I've talked about this movie longer than the movie. <laughs> I'm going to have to do like a commentary track for this movie at some point. I'm so fascinated by it. Like, roping a friend to do it. Poor, poor, poor naive friend. So yeah, I'll give this a 1 out of 10. Definitely worth skipping. If you're like me and you're really into films and you're looking for some bizarre, just trippy, like mind-bending experience as like a who would make this movie rather than the movie itself, this you might want to watch. Or if you're like, I think it would maybe be fun if you had like, see, it's not, the problem is, I would say it might be fun like if you have a couple of friends around and you have like a drink and watch a bad movie and have a laugh at it. Except the comedy in this isn't funny. So, like, the bad things are funny, but the comedy isn't funny. If it wasn't a comedy, if it was a, if it was played like it was a straight action movie and there weren't jokes, it would actually be better. Because you could just laugh at it the whole way through. But the comedy scenes are really bad. Like, really unfunny. Today, I'll be watching Mean Streets on Netflix, which is directed by... Martin Scorsese from 1973, but obviously I've not watched that yet. So, we'll find out how I feel about that and seven more movies next week. I hope you're looking forward to that. I hope... Uh, oh yeah, I was going to say what my favourite movie was for the week. I forgot about that. That's like a fun little segment idea I thought of. And I'll say, my favourite movie of the week, I think they were all pretty strong, apart from two. <laughs> you know, two out of the five. You know, just a small... Just, you know, two-fifths. Uh, but, uh, looking through them, I think, even though I think Being John Malkovich was the best film I watched this week, I think that is the best film, I think Escape from New York was my favourite. I just enjoyed it more and had more fun watching it. Like, Being John Malkovich is definitely the film, like, if you were to say to me which of these films is better, Being John Malkovich is clearly the better film I think but I enjoyed Escape from New York more just because I kind of like those kind of movies I kind of like that kind of 80s kind of era movie is it 80s it is it's 81 right it is 81 yes but memory's not as bad as I remember it being but yeah I hope you enjoyed this I I enjoyed filming it I'm not going to enjoy having to edit it a lot because half of it is me coughing <laughs> So that's going to be fun, having to edit all those out and then realising I've missed a sentence and you're going to have one sentence that doesn't fit in at all in terms of audio quality where I'll just be like, and point three is this, you know, in a completely different, completely different background noise. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you guys like it. I hope you do because it's something different and I think it's something fun I could do and I like talking about movies. So... I'd like to keep doing this. I'm well, I'm going to keep watching the films, but I'd like to talk about them more because I like them. I'm also looking for suggestions because 365 movies is a lot of movies. I'm going to include new releases, like because I got a Odeon Limitless card for my Christmas, so I can go and see as many movies as I want, like new releases. So I'm going to take advantage of that. Fits in nicely. So there will be some new movies. I'm going to do certain theme parts of the year I've already been thinking, so like, in October, you never guess what, I'm going to do a lot of horror movies. Who would have seen that coming? Uh, but, yeah, so any suggestions you guys have, I'll do. Obviously, if I've seen them, I'm not going to do them, because that kind of defeats the point of this. So, you know, I'm not going to be... So there'll be certain films that people might be like, oh, do Airplane, and I'm like, I've seen it, like, 20 times. <laughs> But like, yeah, so any suggestions you guys have, comment them, 
like good movies, bad movies. If you're suggesting a bad movie, tell me it's a bad movie. Because like I want to keep them on like a specific day. I want to keep them on Saturday. Because I think watching the bad movies, like the really bad movies on the Saturday, I think will be better because they'll be fresher in my memory to talk about them more. Because The Amazing Bulk, I've, well, it will stay with me for the rest of my life and probably haunt my dreams. Uh, sorry, I just think about the cars again. The cars, the cars are like paint. The cars are made in MS Paint. There, the, the, the move, Amazing Bulk's done. There, there, closing the book. It's not there anymore. It doesn't exist. But yeah, anything you guys would recommend? I'd love to hear it. Like any foreign language films, anything really. Because I'm, I'm into movies a lot. And I like watching new movies. So, recommend them. Thank you, that'd be nice. If you enjoyed this, you could leave a like and you could share it with people who might like it. That would be cool. And you could subscribe to my channel and follow me as I go through this and slowly lose my grip on sanity. <laughs> the amazing bulk might have already done that, but you know. It's not like I slowly, slowly go mad from watching a different movie every day for the next calendar year. So that'll be 52 episodes, I think. I don't know. I don't know how the uh, how the year lines up in terms of, you know, how many weeks there actually are, if it's 52 or if it'll be 53 or, you know, whatever. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next week for seven more movies. Yay! Bye!